Okay, hi everybody. Sorry about that, we're a little bit of a delay. It just get, kept getting that fun little buffering wheel. YouTube saying, looking for the stream, looking for the stream. Sorry, streaming is not available right now. Love that, love that. But you sit there powerless waiting for the technology to catch up. Uh, anyway, so welcome back folks. Uh, missed you all last week. It just wasn't gonna happen with my schedule, so. Uh, I've had a couple questions over the years, but I had a question very recently from uh, actually uh, a patron of the show, somebody who has supported the show at patreon.com slash renaissance woodworker. Thank you, by the way. Um, there is a level there where you actually can kind of sponsor a single topic show, and that's really where this is coming from. So with that fun little uh, advertisement out of the way, we're gonna talk about plane tracks. Most pointedly, how to eliminate plane tracks. Um, and what that really is going to turn into is more of a sharpening lesson than anything else. Um, first, we'll talk about you know, what is a plane track, but I do want to spend some time talking about um, why you shouldn't obsess over them. I, I do get a lot of people being very, very concerned about the plane tracks that show up on uh, the, the, the wood of their projects. Certainly, there are areas and times where you want to remove them, and there are times when you just don't care. And then there's super secret option number three, where you can go kind of strike a compromise. And there's a, a setup you can do to your blades. It's kind of halfway between no plane tracks and a little bit of plane tracks. So if there's time, we'll talk about that. So anyway, uh, as usual, uh, chat room is up. If you do have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat room and put them in all caps if you can, makes it easier for me. But I'm gonna just jump kind of right into this and talk a little bit about um, plane tracks. What are they? Well. Um, the best way I know is to actually create them rather than talk about them too much. Um, I'm going to use my jack plane and one of the things that is important to realize if you're not getting, if you're not getting plane tracks, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> That's a bit extreme, but there's a lot of people out there I see who are planing away and you know, doing a heck of a lot of work. They are producing these thin gossamer shavings and maybe they're not getting plane tracks or maybe the plane tracks aren't really visible until you put um, finish on it or maybe under raking light. So for instance, this particular board, especially because it's, it's very light colored, I don't really see any plane tracks here. If I rub my finger over the surface, there's kind of it's not really overt. I can't feel like step ledges. And, and really what the plane track is, is the corner of the blade digging in. As I take a pass down the middle of this board, well, let's find a <laughs> section where it's not hollow. If I take a pass down this board, this hard edge that you see on the shaving, that's the corner of the blade that's actually digging into the board. So it's reduced the thickness of the board and it's left a tiny little step, tiny little ledge. So in this case, I don't really see the plane tracks. Maybe I feel something, it's hard to tell, but when I hold this up to raking light, I very clearly see the lines or the tracks left by the plane. Well, those are pretty subtle. And the reason that I say if you're not getting them, you're doing something wrong, is because you're taking too light of a shaving. If you are dimensioning of a board, if you are, certainly if you're working with roughs on stock, um, or if you've just got a board that you need to flatten, you need to joint to get ready for joinery, there's no reason to be taking thin, wispy gossamer shavings. You wanna crank your depth adjuster, take a heavier cut, and really do some work. Now, this shaving, look at that sucker. Clearly, clearly defined edges. Sharp, hard edges on both sides of the shaving. That is clearly going to be producing a, a plane track. I mean, the thickness of that thing is substantial, but more importantly, I've got very, very obvious plane tracks left on this board. Let me give you a little bit of light. See, bingo. Very obvious plane tracks on that board. I mean, you can actually see the path of the plane running down. That's the width of the blade on my joiner plane as it made that pass. But this is incredibly efficient work. If I need to flatten out a board, why would I 
have a super light gossamer shaving and take a whole bunch of passes when I can take one pass. I just put that down the wrong direction, didn't I? Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say that was a lot harder than it should have been because I just went against the grain. I can take one pass and then stack a pass next to it, another pass next to that, another pass next to that, and I have essentially flattened that board. Now, this shaving is relatively thick, so I flattened it to the tolerance dictated by the thickness of the shaving, but come on, people. That is a flat board. There's really no reason to be taking light gossamer shavings. So if you are using your jack plane or using your joiner plane and you are not getting plane tracks, you are not using that plane as it was intended, and you're perpetuating the myth that hand tools are slow because milling boards do not have to take long. It can be a very quick process. It can be done, certainly, if you've got a rough sawn board like this piece here. You know, this is why we employ heavier tools like a four plane. Well, a four plane or a, ja or a scrub plane, that's taking a massively thick shaving. And, you know, I could spend a bunch of time evening it out and getting a nice, e or a nice continuous shaving, or I can just strengthen or deepen my depth of cut and go one more there and flat my board like that. So how flat is this board? Well, yeah, I've got a curved iron on my plane here, but that is pretty dang flat. You'll see a little bit of, of, of daylight passing through simply because I've got undulations caused by the curved iron here, but this sucker is flat. So I've removed the rough saw. Now I come back with my jack plane. I haven't touched the depth of cut here. It's still a heavy depth of cut. Now I can knock off those undulating surfaces and really get this into like a joinery ready surface. I probably could have done some joinery on that surface that had undulations from the, um, from the foreplane, but now I've gotten rid of those little scallop marks and I have a much flatter board. No little daylight popping out here because of the fact that I've now flattened out those undulations, but I have created plane tracks. See one right there. They're there, but again, you know, they start to disappear and it only it requires that raking light for them to start to pop out. They are definitely um, tactile. I can certainly feel them, but this board is now ready for the next step, ready for joinery. And yes, it's got plain tracks all over it, but say this board, this face ended up being the inside of a cabinet. Do I need to remove those plain tracks? Hell no. You can, you know, call it pride in your work or some other, whatever, whatever you want to tell yourself to justify the extra work to do that. But again, this board does not look bad. This board is going to take finish really well. There's really no reason to, to deal with the additional step and the additional headache of removing those plane tracks. Because here's the other thing. This board is now flat, but it is flat to a certain tolerance, right? It's flat to whatever the, the, the thickness of shaving this plane is creating over the length of this sole. That's still a pretty tight tolerance. Well, now I'm going to come back with my smoothing plane that already I've got a shorter sole, right? So I'm tightening up the tolerance a little bit more there and I'm going to set it to take, you know, wispy gossamer shaving. That's too heavy. I'm going to back it out even more. There. Now I'm taking shavings that are probably half a thousandth of an inch thick. And those are nice and lovely and gossamer and fun, but I'm also not getting a perfect full length shaving, right? Because I've just dramatically tightened up the tolerance, tightened up how flat this board is. So now this plane has to come back and make multiple passes in order to flatten out the board to the new tolerance. And you know, it's not that big of a deal, but I've already gone across the board once. Now I'm working back the other direction and I'm now just starting to get more complete shavings, but not, 
I'm not there yet. So I'm going to go back across the width a third time. Now we're getting there. And we're getting there. Now this board, this board has zero plane tracks. It is gorgeous. That line right there that you're seeing, that is not a plane track. That is a mineral streak. <laughs> and if you're not certain, rub your hand across it. Baby butt smooth, gorgeous. Running under raking light, it looks absolutely, I mean, it's polished. It's a shiny, polished surface. If you can see the glare or the glint off of that. So now this surface is truly finish ready, will look gorgeous under any light, under any surface. But again, if it were the inside of a case, all of that work that I just did, and frankly, this is easy because this is a small piece. It's also very agreeable um, quarter sawn stock here. So that, that was a lot easier than it would be over a full case side or something like that, that had more undulations, more unevenness that you've got to work out with the smoothing plane. Granted, a smoothing plane, you can stack the cards in your favor by going smaller and going to like a number two size guy. So now this sole is, is shorter, but it will ride through those hills and valleys and it'll get more of that continuous shaving a little bit faster. But it's still an extra step that may or may not be necessary. So that out of the way, I really wanted to open with that because I do think people spend way too much time planing and way too much time trying to get the perfect surface, spending way too much time with a smoothing plane in their hand when nine times out of 10, it's really not necessary for whatever it is you're making. Here's the other thing. Um, plane tracks are not evil. They are not a sign of poor craftsmanship. Um, there was a study, and one of these days I need to go find the study. This was probably 10 years ago. This was brought to my attention by uh, a Windsor chair maker. And um, he said that there was a, a study of a couple Windsor chairs and then a couple cabinet pieces that were put in like an auction house. And they just set them out there and uh, put like, you know, Windsor chair. They didn't put a maker or anything. They just identified it. Windsor chair and cabinet under both of them. And they just let people go and look at them as they were preparing for the auction, kind of, do I want to bid on this or whatever? And like nine out of 10 people, it was more than that, it was a larger sample size, but 99% will say of the people, they went up and they stood looking at the two Windsor chairs and stood looking at the two cabinets and they always went up and had to touch it. That's the wonderful thing about wooden furniture. It just, it begs to be touched. 99% of the time, they touched the one that was made by hand that had surface imperfections on it as compared to the Windsor chair that was made using machines, the cabinet made using machines, and the cabinet made using hand tools, hand planes, handmade. The little imperfections, undulations in the surface, plane tracks, all of those things, the little facets caused by chisels and things, they catch and reflect the light differently and they give more depth, more luster, more interest to the surface of a board or the surface of a cabinet or the surface of a seat or something like that than a perfectly flat, machine flat, sanded and abraded surface. 99% of those people, when they went to touch the piece, they went to the handmade one. And, and no one really said, oh, look at this, this is handmade. No one, no one knew the difference but just that, that gut instinct took them towards the one that showed more character. So I will submit to you that plane tracks could actually add some character to your piece. When I initially started with this board, this yellow cedar board, and I had my jack plane taking a uh, lighter cut. And I said, you know, these plane tracks are, are, are pretty subtle. Well, let me go back, see if I can get back to that depth of cut. That's way too light. That's like smoothing plane light. There we go. So now I'm getting pretty thin shaving. This might be two and a half, three thousandths of an inch thick. One of these days I should get a micrometer and actually measure these and see if I'm at all close to my, to my guesstimates here. We'll just call it a heavy light shaving. So now I plane this board with these. And if you really want to, to tell, you just compare your shavings. This was the really heavy one that made very, very obvious plane tracks. And this is the one that I just took. And just feeling it, this is easily like 
half the thickness of this one. Um, uh, scientists will tell you that the human finger can tell the difference between a thousandth of an inch. Whatever, right? But <laughs> you know, run your finger over a flat surface and you'll feel imperfections of a thousandth of an inch. This I can say just by feeling it is probably half the thickness. So again, that jack plane did its work relatively quickly and look at that surface. Look at the glint on that surface. Do you see any plane tracks there? There are some plane tracks there, believe me. I can run my hand over and I can feel that, but that surface does not look bad at all. So do we need to remove plane tracks? Sometimes, yes. I think I've made my point. It's, it's not the end of the world to be showing plane tracks on a piece of furniture. I have made several pieces of furniture where I missed something on the finish. And I'll be sitting, um, I've got a, a walnut shaker pedestal table I made several years ago. It sits next to an easy chair upstairs. And I was sitting in it the other day and I went to pick my glass up off the coaster and just the way the light was coming through the front window, I said, oh look, there's a plane track. It's been there for Hainesville School students. When did I build that? That was semester four. So 2013, 2014 maybe is when I built that. I just now noticed that there was a plane track on the surface. Lightning hasn't struck me down. <laughs> No one has come and repossessed the piece of furniture, taken my woodworker card or anything like that. It happens. So that's the first lesson of this lesson. Plane tracks are not evil. So if you're really struggling to get rid of them, move on, focus on something else and maybe come back later. So what happens when we want to remove plane tracks like I just did on this piece of teak? Well, to do that, you have to add some curvature to the blade. This smoothing plane, as the blade is sharpened now, couldn't tell you the radius of the, of their, of the, the curve on the blade. You know, it would be too wide to really say it's you know, a 27 inch radius or anything like that. You measure it, I guess, in an arc segment more than anything else. I don't care what that number is. What I know is that when the blade, when the corners of the blade are tucked up into the sole. So when the blade is retracted to the point where those corners are now not cutting and they tucked up inside the body, what I've got left is about a thousandth of an inch. The shaving that I'm taking is about a thousandth of an inch thick and the corners, rather than just coming to an abrupt corner and creating a track, the blade disappears and kind of feathers into the inside of the body. So when I take a shaving here, This shaving, let me grab one of these uh, joiner or jack plane shavings. Again, remember what I was talking about where this hard edge, this very sharp edge definitely talks about, it, this tells you that you're gonna get a plane track. There's a corner digging in here. Now look at this smoothing plane shaving. If I can unravel it without it falling apart. The edges are not nearly as defined. There is a bit of a harder edge over on this side than there is on this side. But if I run my fingers across the thickness, you can actually feel it kind of tapering off into nothing. And if you look real close at the edges, you'll actually see that they, they're a bit ragged. They, they taper into nothingness. Um, I could probably back my cut off a hair. Let's see if I can do this. And take that pass again. Now the shaving is even thinner um, it's also narrower, which I'll get to in a second, but now, see, I can't, I can barely even unravel this thing. Teak's not the best species to, to demonstrate this, but, uh, the edges, oh, good Lord. The edges just disappear. They become pretty much transparent at the edges and then disappear into nothing. And it's starting to actually unravel and, and fall apart because the thickness of the shaving If I've got a shaving here that's like that thick, we're looking at it in cross section, what's happening is it's tapering away to nothing. So the thickness of it across this dimension, say it's a thousandth of an inch thick here, and it tapers away to zero on the sides. And what you're actually creating in the board, if this center line is the surface of the board, this little scoop, this little scallop you're creating is what your smoothing plane is created. But 
the distance from the surface of the board to the bottom of that scallop is like a thousandth of an inch. So what I'm actually doing with my finely set smoothing plane is creating the same surface that I just created with my four plane that has a nine inch radius, big all honking curve on the bottom of that blade, very, very visible curve in the bottom of the blade. It's the exact same shape, it's just really, really subtle. Now the other thing is, the more radical the curve you put on your plane blade, the narrower the shaving is gonna be. So, I should really stop throwing all these shavings away because I keep reaching for them. Um, oh heck, let's just do this again. <laughs> this is my super, super light cut. And turn it about a quarter turn and do a heavier cut. And that was actually a little more than a quarter of a turn. And I'll get to that. Let me, let me use that as a demonstration point. So I'm going to back that off about a quarter. There. One of the things when you're dealing with really, really thin shavings like this is that single pass I took down the middle actually just threw that board out of flat. So as I'm changing the tolerance, as I'm adjusting the depth adjuster, I'm changing the tolerance created by this plane. So I took a heavier shaving over here, then I took a lighter shaving in the middle, and really in order to get the most accurate shaving, I need to go all the way across the surface and back and get everything to the same level. So sometimes when you, when you keep adjusting the plane, you'll find that it's not taking consistent shavings right away, and you've gotta take three or four passes in order to kind of balance everything out again, reset everything. So I've got three shavings from the same plane, three different settings. This one is the super, super light, probably half a thou thick, but you'll notice that it's not particularly wide. It is just for giggles. It's about an inch and an eighth wide. This one is set to about a thousandth of an inch. It's still tapering off nicely, still not producing plane tracks, and it is inch and a half, inch and a half. Sorry, inch and three eighths. I can read a ruler. So inch and an eighth, inch and three eighths. And now this guy was taken heavier and we are just under two inches. And if I remember correctly, that is the full width of the blade. It's just under two inches. This is a two inch blade. <laughs> This shaving, and again, you know, it's not the most accurate measurement because the shaving's starting to fall apart on me, but this shaving is, one would probably say it's about two inches, but it might be a 30 second narrower than two, than two inches. The point being, the, the um, curvature of the blade will affect the width of the shaving. So because I've got a really, really shallow curve, just by increasing it from a half a thousand of an inch thick shaving to a thousand of an inch thick shaving, I have, depending on which way you go, gained or lost, uh, um, what did I say? About two eighths, about a quarter of an inch in the width, the cutting width of the blade. But the blade is actually two inches wide. So with that thousand of an inch, with the curves, um, with the curve curvature put in there, taking a thousand of an inch shaving, I'm actually only getting what, about two thirds of the total width of the blade. So one could make a case that I could actually reduce the curvature on this blade even a little bit more and get a wider shaving at a thousand of an inch thick. Knowing that though, when I increased this depth for this last shaving and I got a full width blade, I made that pass over here. If I run my fingers over it, it is subtle, but there is a plane track right there. I've now increased the depth of cut on that particular radius of blade to the point where it's now producing a plane track. So the first thing in eliminating plane tracks is reduce your depth of cut. If you reduce the depth of cut, there's a better chance that you're not gonna get a plane track, assuming there is a curvature on your blade. Technically, you can create a plane track free surface without putting any kind of curvature on the blade, and that's when you are talking about thousands, half a thou thickness. Go to any Lee Nielsen event, and you'll see Deneb Polhowski do it with a perfectly flat blade. It is not necessary, but it's a lot easier to get rid of your plane tracks 
if you have that camber put on it. So um, the point that I want to make here is the amount of curvature you put into the blade doesn't really matter as long as you recognize the more the curvature, the, the less the effective planing area of your plane will be. And this is a nice number four with a two inch wide blade. But if I go down to my number two, this is what? Uh, one and three quarters, one and five eighths. So I'm already down to one and five eighths. If I add a camber onto this blade, I could end up you know, under an inch wide on my, um, my effective uh, um, cutting width, which may or may not be a problem, but it's just something to think about. Add too much curve and you're gonna be working even harder. Same thing actually applies with the four plane or the scrub plane. My scrub plane definitely takes a narrower shaving because it's got a much more radical curve. It's got a three inch radius curve. This has an eight inch radius curve. It takes a wider cut. I could take this probably up to a 10 inch radius and get a wider cut from it, but I actually find just through a lot of trial and error that eight inches works better in this particular plane. It means that I have to take a heavier cut, increase my depth of cut in order to get a wider shaving, but that's fine because that's what I want to do anyway. So be aware of that relationship, how the width of the shaving will change based upon the depth adjuster and the radius of the curve that you create. So let me show you how I go about sharpening this blade. Um, I will stop and take a breath for a second because I know there were some questions going on in here. So um, other than sharpness, is there any reason why I can't take a thick full width shaving like those from your jack? Uh, lots of reasons. Um, I say this in the hand tool school all the time, but yes, sharpness, sharp fixes everything. So if you're not getting um, consistent shavings, sharp may be an issue, especially if you're getting a lot of dust issues, that may be an issue. Um, so look at your sharpening, try sharpening it, try stropping it and see what happens. If you start getting really good shavings straight off the sharpening stones or the strop, um, that fixed your problem. But if it goes away really quickly, then the durability of your edge is the issue and you might wanna rethink your sharpening. I talked about this a couple of uh, live streams ago about refining the edge in order to get a more durable edge. So that may be the other thing to look at. The other thing to consider is how flat is the board? And I've talked about this where just now when I was changing the depth of cut on the smoothing plane, I'm changing the topography in a very subtle way, but I can do the same thing with this board I can take a heavy pass with the jack plane and another heavy pass with the jack plane. And those two passes were kind of right next to one another. And what I'd like to do, let me just put a reference line on here, is say that reference line demarcates the center of the blade. I'm centering my plane over that line as I make a pass. The next pass that I make, I don't want to set it way over here. I want to, I made a second line to make this easier. So I put another line next to it. And actually, let's do it this way. Three lines. Here's the center line. This line marks one edge of the blade. This line marks the other edge of the blade. So this is the swath I am cutting with the plane. So as I come down, I, I pull out a channel that wide. Well, instead of then coming over here and cutting a channel next to it, that's all that's gonna do is create a little raised spot in between. So what I do is I aim to go half the distance. So I'm moving the center of the plane. We see the center line here. Now I'm gonna move the center of the plane to the extent of that. So it's moving about half the width over. And what that allows me to do is overlap my plane passes so that I don't end up with a little ridge in between. So that's one thing that can cause a problem. If you find you're not getting consistent shavings, it's possible that you took a little too big of a step as you went laterally across the board and you've left a little ridge. Well, what that ridge is doing, it's actually tipping the plane. That plane, instead of sitting flat on the surface, it's now raised up a little because it's resting on that ridge. So you're not getting a very good shaving. Maybe you're getting a little skinny shaving that just comes out of the left side of the plane, which is the next point. You see that I'm, I'm usually pretty fastidious about removing the shaving from the plane with every pass. And that's not me being, you know, OCD. That's because I want to be able to see the shape of the shaving and the location of the shaving as it comes out of the plane. If, 
here's a skinny shaving that came out. If I see that, or, oh, here's another good example. This shaving that came out, it came out all the way across, but it's actually split down the middle. I have two shavings that came out. And the reason for that is I left a little ridge down the middle and that ridge bumped the plane out of the cut and it started to actually create two shavings rather than one. So the topography of the board will shift and lift, tilt the plane from side to side, tilt it up, down, that can cause the blade to just be lifted out of the cut and therefore not producing um, a consistent shaving. And that's kind of the biggest thing is even if um, like you're a hybrid guy and you've got you know, your power joiner, well, if you take a board from the power joiner, depending on how well the joiner's set up, how deep the cut you just took on the joiner, and go to a smoothing plane, you think, oh, this board is flat, it just came off a power joiner, and I just tuned that sucker up. You take a pass with the smoothing plane, where it is set right now at about a thousand of an inch, there's no way in hell you're gonna get consistent length shaving. You're gonna have all kinds of problems getting shavings on this because the tolerance on this guy is so much tighter than the tolerance on your joiner plane. And you're gonna to have to mate four and five passes back and forth across the board in order to bring that electric joiner flattened board into the same flatness that this plane can create. And that's not a, ooh, hand planes are better than power joiners. It's just, it shows you the difference in tolerance. Your power joiner has a tolerance here and your smoothing plane has a tolerance way up here, much, much flatter than you're getting off of here. And you've got to bridge that gap between those two. And that's what I see more than anything else that's not creating consistent shavings. The important thing, the really the way to answer that question is take a look at your shavings. What kind of shavings are you getting? Is the shaving full width of the blade, but it's not full length of the board? Well, then you've got little bumps along the length of the board that's causing the plane to, to ride up and over. Is the shaving not full width? Well, then you've probably got little ridges in the board or you've got hollows in the board and the board itself is just not flat. So here again, way back to the beginning of this conversation when I talked about how if you're not getting plane tracks, you're doing it wrong. One of the best ways you can, you can figure this out, deepen your depth, just deepen your cut and then come back. I just turned this, I don't know, an eighth of a turn. Now come back. I'm getting a full width, full length shaving because I'm taking a heavy shaving here. But what this can do is kind of hit reset on the whole board. So now I've gone by, gone across this board. I stacked my cuts all the way across. I've got heavy plane tracks on here, but I know having taken full width shaving after full width shaving after full width shaving, actually after full width shaving, because I overlap quite a bit, these shavings, if you were to put them side by side by side, will equal this board and then some because of some overlap. So what I know now is that I have a pretty consistent geometric plane. And now, I've got some kind of, forgive the, 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 the pun here, level playing field in which to start reducing my depth of cut and refining my surface, either eliminating those plane tracks, eliminating tear out. I mean, certainly when you take a heavy cut on a difficult board, you're probably gonna get tear out. I'm choosing, you know, planing demonstration wood lumber here. This is beautiful straight grain Alaskan yellow cedar. You know, this is the stuff that you see at, uh, at uh, woodworking shows and you wonder, how do they get such wonderful shavings? Well, we use the right wood too. Um, but that having that, that, that level playing field to start with could really help you now begin to diagnose what's going wrong. As I reduce my depth of cut, the shavings start to fall apart. They start to not line up properly. Well, again, that's a flatness, that's a tolerance issue. And you have to pay attention to the shape of the shaving and the location of the shaving in the plane and go back to kind of spot planing. If I'm only getting a shaving from one side, well then I must have a high spot on the right side that's lifting the plane out of the cut. So let me shift my plane over and focus on trying to remove that high spot, et cetera, et cetera. So there isn't a, a, an easy answer because you know, there's a thousand and one variables in the topography of the board, but the shape of the shaving and the location will tell you where you need to make that adjustment. Uh, what is the optimal mouth opening size on a plane to reduce tear out and jamming? Uh, there is no optimal, there is no one number. Um, it depends on the type of plane you're using, the type of cut you wanna make, the type of species you're using, the type of grain pattern on that wood. So, I mean, and, and jamming is one thing, you know. Uh, ideally, if you don't want the plane to clog, you need the mouth opening to be as wide as the shaving you plan to take 
and probably about half a thickness thereafter. So if I'm taking a shaving that is a thousandth of an inch thick, I probably want my mouth to be one and a half thousandths of an inch wide. Again, nobody's measuring this stuff. I'm just using these numbers as an example. So if the, the, the shaving you're taking is a quarter inch wide, then I want a three eighths of an inch wide mouth opening. I wanna see you take a quarter inch shaving. I've done it on a, on a, on a scrub plane before. It wasn't fun. Um, and that will pretty much guarantee you get tear out as well. So that mouth opening needs to obviously be wider than the shaving or it's going to jam. And it needs to have a little bit more wiggle room. That's why I say go half again the thickness of the shaving and you shouldn't have any, any clogging issues. But the tear out issue, thousand and one variables have to do with that. The mouth opening, um, to avoid tear out, you want that mouth opening to be as tight as possible. So again, one and a half times the thickness of the shaving, that should help you with that. But if you've got really gnarly grain, sometimes the mouth opening isn't enough. And sometimes you've got to figure other things out, like go back to sharpening, get a really, really sharp blade, um, uh, um, scoot your chip breaker up a little bit, um, change the angle of attack by going with a higher angle um, frog, or go with a scraper, go with a bevel up plane. It's not, it, it's, there's a bunch of different factors there and a lot of it can change based upon the species of wood you're using as well. So um, I, I do think if you go with that one and a half, the thickness of the shaving part, that will help you. Um, which, you know, unless your plane has an adjustable mouth, which this one doesn't, that can get really difficult. Which is why people are like, well, why do you have so many smoothing planes? Well, this is truly my like half a thou, thousand of an inch thick smoothing plane. This guy is for heavier work. I, I, I do use this for smoothing, but it gets used for a lot of, of smaller jointing work, smaller project work. And this is really set up to cut like, you know, five times the thickness of that. Um, so I back the frog off more to allow more of a mouth opening. And the more you, you know, change it around, obviously the more flexibility you want. This bevel up smoothing plane has an adjustable mouth opening. I also can change blades in and change the, the effective cutting angle and all that fun stuff. So it does, it does get futzed around with a little bit more based upon the situation. Honestly, this is like my nuclear option. When I've got a board that just will not cooperate, I pull out this guy because it is so adjustable. The mouth opens adjusting, the mouth is adjustable. The blade, I can change the bevel angle on the blade and change the cutting action. And I can play with all those variables in order to get the result that I want. You know, if it's a really, weird species of wood that just doesn't want to cooperate. All right, let's talk sharpening, shall we? Um, need to go to a different camera angle, but um, my key in this is keep it simple. Don't get too caught up in numbers and, you know, arc segments. And I've heard some people refer to camber as how much material you remove from the corners. So, you know, I removed a 32nd of an inch from each corner uh, and then kind of even that out to give me a curve. There's nothing wrong with going that route. I just find that it's, it makes things more difficult to repeat. Um, and the way that I do this and the subtlety, rather, let me rephrase that, the um, extremely small curve that I'm creating here is kind of difficult to reproduce unless you've like pulling out feeler gauges and things like that. And that's just not the way I roll. I don't have any feeler gauges in my shop. So what I do is I actually, when I create the camber, it's unique every time. In other words, I will actually erase the camber what I'm gonna do is erase this camber and come back to a perfectly flat edge and then add the camber. And this is something that I'll do maybe once per project. Um, you know, this is the plane that I pull out when it's time to get ready for finishing. This is the finished prep plane. So I built whatever the project is. I've joined it all. I've cleaned it up as much as I can. Now I'm ready to apply the finish. So I need to go over every surface with this last plane in order to get it sparkly smooth and, and baby fresh to apply the finish. So at that point, I will come over to my stones and I'll do what I'm about to show you. I will erase the camber, add the camber. And then throughout that project, I may plane a whole bunch of surfaces. The size of the project may mean that I'm smooth planing for a couple of days, but I will maintain that curvature using my strop during that time. Um, 
I probably could get away with more than one project depending upon the size of the project. I'm not super dulling the wood if I'm, or dulling the blade if I'm using an agreeable wood. I just find that it's a lot easier per project, again, sharp fixes everything, to just start over with a nice clean blade. So that being said, let's do that. Um, okay. Diamond stones, sandpaper, water stones, whatever you want to use, it's going to work. Okay, I have fine, extra fine, and extra, extra fine diamond stones here. I'm going to flip this to the fine side and start there because I'm doing what I consider to be more kind of sculpture work at this point where I'm actually changing the shape that I've got. I'm eliminating the curve. So if you do this freehand or if you use a guide, it's just like you would sharpen anything. I'm just going to drop it in there, find that bevel angle, and I'm just going to work the whole blade. When I freehand work, I always, instead of going straight across, I like to skew it. Kind of acts like an outrigger, allows me to feel that blade a lot better. So what I'm doing here, and the reason that I went to my coarser stone, because it's just going to work faster. And what I want is to feel that burr. I feel a burr, but I'll just use my fingernail. And dragging the fingernail over, it will actually catch on the burr. And what I want to do is run it. I'm not on the face. I'm kind of on the heiress. I'm on the, the edge itself. I run my finger down to the corner, and if it doesn't catch, then I know that there's still some curvature left there. No, it's not catching. So while it's catching here, and I can feel that burr, it's not at the corner. So I've got a little bit more work to do. Oh, there it goes. It's subtle. I mean, you feel it, but generally in doing this, you're actually breaking the burr off. Yep. There we go. So now it runs all the way back. I, I've now flattened this out. You know, you could hold the straight edge, straight edge up to it and everything, but again, this curve is so slight that you're probably not really gonna see it very much anyway. I mean, I suppose you could hold it right up to a light, but let's not mess with all that stuff. It's not necessary to get that carried away. So now I'm going to flip over to just make sure that there's no gunk on here since it was just on the on the, the base. So now I'm just going to work up through the grit and sharpen the entire edge. There's my burr. I'm good to go. Now over to my extra extra fine stone. This is my last stage. And there's my burr. Now, since I'm at the final stage, I'm just going to go ahead and swipe that off. I could be swiping it off in between, but it's so delicate that just by trying to feel it, I usually knock it off. So I don't really worry about, you know, lapping the back, especially because the back is so flat. You can see it's sticking to the stone. Okay. There we go. I need a towel. So now, if I were to put this blade back in my smoothing plane and set it the way I had it set before, I'm going to get plane tracks. But again, those plane tracks are going to be pretty dang subtle. If I'm taking a thousandth of an inch thick shaving, I am going to maybe feel, maybe see under raking light plane tracks, but you're going to have to work to see that. Um, so this by itself really could be a very effective smoothing plane. And you may not have to worry about plane tracks too much. But I do want to set it up the way I had it before and turn it into a finely tuned plane track eliminating machine. So what I'm going to do is go back one grit 
on the stone. Again, this extra, extra fine, this is pure polishing. This does not remove a lot of material. It will, but it's gonna take a hell of a lot more passes. First rule of freehand sharpening is eliminate the idiot in the, in the equation. I am the idiot, hi, that's me. I'm the weakest link in this situation. The more I have to be involved in this, the more I'm gonna screw up. So stack the cards in your favor, use a higher grit stone, take fewer strokes and you won't screw up as much. So now I'll feel the bevel and instead of putting my hands evenly on the blade, I'm gonna move all my pressure over to the left hand side and I'm gonna count my strokes here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20 is the number that I like. It's what I've used, used for many, many years. You may have to experiment with that. You may wanna add more. You may wanna subtract some more. This is part of this process is figuring out what that number needs to be. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So, now, I wiped the burr off before, remember on the back? If I run my finger down the center of the blade, I feel no burr. If I run it down the side, <gasps> clink, there's a burr right there. Clink, there's a burr right there. So what have I done? I've actually lowered these sides just by applying finger pressure, just transferring all of my pressure. And really, because of the fact that there's no burr in the middle, and I could actually look at the scratch pattern on this and probably see that it's really not cutting in the middle. Even though it's on the stone, the pressure is over here on the side and it's enough pressure to kind of re relieve any cutting pressure off the middle. So effectively, there is a curve here. That could be better. And I wanna make it a little bit more subtle instead of, cause I might, what I might've done is just created a facet. Instead of it being a curve, I've just got these like chamfers on the side. So now, and again, this is a two inch wide blade, a blade narrower than this, I probably wouldn't do this step. But what I'm gonna do now, instead of putting all of my pressure right over on the edge, I'm gonna come somewhere in between that. So if you divide the blade into quarters, um, I'm gonna put my pressure in the quarter section, halfway between the edge and the, the center of the blade. And I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna take half as many strokes. So I did 10 strokes before, now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Same thing on the other side. Go to the quarter point, find that bevel. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Et voila. Again, I can feel a little burr right there, but I'm not feeling one in the center. So what I've now done, and what I may have done, is just created a series of facets, but they're now smaller facets. Really, I find that just by applying pressure, though, is it doesn't really create a facet, it just it creates more of a curve. So now that I've sculpted or shaped the blade the way I want it, I'm going to come over to my finest stone. This is harder to do with this camera angle, so I'm gonna turn it this way. What I would normally do is stand on the bench and work sideways, but that I'll end up blocking the camera. So I don't recommend doing this because I'm leaning out over the bench, but you can do it. What I'll do now is I'm going to go side to side. And I'm actually kind of applying a little bit of torque to my wrist. Um, let me back up just a little bit on the camera. When I do it, when I square my shoulders to the bench like this, I actually am swaying my hips. I call this process dancing like a fifth grader. You plant your feet and you just sway your, heads, your hips back and forth. You're that nervous fifth grade boy at the dance who finally got somebody to dance with him. <laughs> you have no moves whatsoever. This is, by the way, this is how I still dance today. <laughs> You're just swaying your hips back and forth. Well, what that does is in a very small way, you're actually moving your hands through an arc. If I just move back and forth like this, I'm actually tracing an arc. But I do have the blade on the, on the, um, the stone. And the surface tension, which also helps, the more, the more lubricant you put on here, you get more surface tension. Surface tension is holding that down. But what that's doing is it's now following the contours of the blade. Those little angles or those facets that I just created are now 
following that, but it's kind of evening it all out. It's blending it all together, and it's putting that final high stone, fine grit polish on the blade. It's very subtle. In fact, I've done this like way longer than I need to at this point. Now, if I come over here and feel again, I clearly feel a burr all the way along the blade. And what I've done, let me swipe that off real quick. What I've done is create a camber on this blade that is incredibly subtle. How subtle? We don't know. Well, I do know. I do know. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you a number, but again, choosing to do 20 passes on each corner, 10 passes and then an intermediate point, that number has worked well for me to create the size of arc that I want to have the plane perform like we saw at the outset of this demonstration. It does not leave a plane track at a thousandth of an inch thick shaving, but it will start to leave plane tracks if you advance it a little bit beyond that. In other words, I'm getting the maximum width of cut for that depth of cut. So let's uh, put our money where our mouth is and see if it actually works that way. Um, I also follow up every, um, every sharpening with a strop. That is also a great way to kind of blend and polish the, um, the facets that you just created. And you can do the exact same thing here, just going side to side. But I do find that the somewhat pliable nature, the flexible nature of leather, this is one of the reasons strops work so well, it's subtle enough that if you just put a little bit more downward pressure onto the leather, the leather will conform to that tiny little curve you just created. So I'm just going one step further here, supposedly increasing like the grit, the, the, the sharpness here, rather the refinement of the edge. And I'm helping to kind of blend together whatever facets that I created. I feel a burr again. So I'm going to swipe that off. In fact, what I like to do is flip it over to the non-compound side, take four or five more passes, and then pull the burr off on that side. And you actually can see the burr come off. There's a little gray line there where the burr came off. Now we're ready. Give the blade a little wipe down with my rag here. <laughs> While I'm putting this back together. Thane, you really want me to build a sharpening station, don't you? I want to build one too. It's just priorities, man. Um, scrub plane has a cambered iron. You get plane tracks. That's called working efficiently. That's nothing to be ashamed of. That's a badge of honor, man. You're getting plane tracks with a scrub plane? Show me a thickness planer that can cut that deep. Actually, don't. I can show you one. It just, it dims the lights in an area code when you turn it on. It's a 36 inch beast that we have at the mill. Um, hey, Steve, how are you, buddy? I haven't seen you in a while. Started using a 35 degree blade on my number four, five and a half and 62 as the Schwartz recommended. I'm getting much better results. Don't know why, but it's working. Um, well, on you know the 62, it's working because you've increased the cutting angle. The effective cutting angle has been increased because you've added the bevel. Um, the results you may be getting on the four and the five, which are both bevel down planes, may be because you have changed the clearance angle. By steepening the bevel of the plane, you're actually putting a little bit more steel behind the blade and making it a little bit stouter and a little bit more durable. So you probably were getting really good results before, but it maybe wasn't lasting as long. Now your plane is just performing better because it's performing longer. That would be my suggestion. Um, is that what Schwartz recommends? I haven't, uh, I haven't heard that. I, I have no doubt that's something that he says, but I wonder why he says that. Is it for that clearance angle reason? That would be my, my reasoning why. Because on a bevel down plane, Changing the bevel angle doesn't do anything to the cutting angle, but it will do something to the clearance angle and therefore the, um, the durability of that blade. 25 degrees can be kind of fragile, um, especially if you're using a York pitch or even higher pitch frog. 
that's a, that's a very steep angle for a skinny amount of steel at 25 degrees. And also dependent upon the species that you use. Um, you know, if you use really, really hard woods like hard maple or, or any, you know, jungle wood, you will find that that 25 degree um, edge could be particularly fragile and you'll get problems. Okay, so let's do this. Again, my process is always to back the cut off so that it's not actually cutting. Now this, you remember, this board, what did we just do with this board? The last thing we did with this board was um, the jack plane set at a somewhat heavy cut. So not getting a full with shaving. I'm getting a shaving. I'm getting a nice thin shaving. But you'll notice, let's see if I can show it without it falling. Where is that shaving? It's not full width and it's centered over on the right hand side of the plane. And as I made a pass, I was on the right hand side of the plane. So what I'm, what I'm finding is it cut, but something inboard, something in from the edge is lifting the plane out of the cut. And that's why I'm not getting a full width shaving because the board is just not flat enough. But I'm getting a shaving. So let's keep working. Stacking our cuts little by little, side by side across the board. And I'm not getting full width shavings, but I am starting to get full length. It's getting better. So that's one pass across laterally. I'm going to start just where I left off and work my way back from there. Now going back one more time, shavings are getting a lot wider and a lot more consistent, but they still are stacking to the right hand side. So rather than keep repeating the same thing, I could and I will eventually get there, but there's obviously a hump somewhat in the middle that's causing the plane to lift up out of the cut. Because when I come back the other way, I'm getting shavings that are scooted over to the left hand side. So it's cutting on the left and something is lifting the plane up out of the cut. So there's a hump in the middle. So let's just take some passes in the middle and see if we can't create a little hollow. So now stack these, stack these. Now we're coming together. Now I'm getting nice wide ish shavings. There we go. Probably could go back one more time, but here again, <coughs> Alaskan yellow cedar. Smells lovely. My sinuses are cleared. This could probably, I could probably lighten my cut a little bit. Um, you can see the shaving is getting transparent on both edges, but it's still a little defined over here. So am I seeing a plane track? I don't feel any plane tracks. I don't see any plane tracks, but there's every possibility that I'm getting a little bit of digging into the corner and that may be a lateral adjustment issue. Um, you notice that I didn't even go through the step of lateraling, lat lateraling, lateraling adjusting. I don't think that's the way you say that of setting up the lateral adjust. Um, because the curve is so subtle, I can't really see it. Normally what I do is I advance the blade so that I can see it clearly and I just by eye center it in there. But the curvature itself doesn't really matter. Um, excuse me, the curvature is, is not really visible so you're not really gonna see anything by eye. What I would do in this case is I feel like, you know, I need to take another pass to make sure I'm orienting that properly. So the shaving is giving me a harder edge on the right hand side of the blade. So there's every possibility that the curve is shunted a little and I need to adjust that so that I'm tucking the right hand corner into the body a little bit more. Yep. Now the shaving is coming out centered in the body. 
and nice and <laughs> fluffy. And here again, no plane tracks on that board. So it was eliminated by adding that curvature. Now here's, here's the other test. I'm going to advance my uh, adjuster wheel by maybe an eighth of the turn there. And I can tell you just by the shape of these shavings, that hard line, I'm now getting a plane track. Again, it's real, real subtle. I can feel it. I can feel there's a plane track there and there. It's the width of the blade digging in. But, you know, does that make that board look bad? No, not really. But that, just that tiny little adjustment gave me took me from this shaving, about that wide with, you know, transparent edges, to this shaving. I got a fly in here. This shaving with defined edges that is pretty much two inches wide. That was an eighth of a turn on the adjuster wheel. That's how, you know, subtle, but that's the, the kind of tolerance that we're looking for. Um, making that, those 20 passes on each corner of the blade that's the curvature that this creates. If I made 30 passes, I'm gonna create a more radical curvature. So I may be able to advance it an eighth of a turn and not get plane tracks. Advance it maybe another eighth of the turn and not get plane tracks. And what you're gonna see is the shaving width widening and widening and widening until you start to get plane tracks. What I've found that those 20 passes in each corner gives me to the point where I go from a, an acceptable width shaving, about two thirds the width of the blade, to full width shaving in a tiny little adjustment. And literally, we're talking eighth of a rotation. Any less than that, I don't wanna think that way. I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna turn this wheel a 16th. Uh-uh, no, I, I can't, no, can't think that way. So that's the, the balance that you have to strike. That's the experimentation you have to do on your own with whatever, whatever stones you're using. I mean, certainly that would change if I went to water stones, it would change if I went to sandpaper. If I change the grit of my sharpening media, it's going to change the number of passes in each corner in order to achieve that particular curvature. You can't really screw it up. Start little, start with 10 passes and see what happens. And then add 10 more, you know? Um, and if you go too far, you're not gonna get plain tracks, you're just gonna get a slightly narrower shaving and it's not gonna be that big of a deal. Um, you know, if you reduce the width of your shaving by, you know, an eighth of an inch, again, you know, maybe you can flatulate yourself, but no, I don't, I don't, did I just say flatulate? Flagellate yourself. You can flatulate yourself too, but just make sure there's no one around and you have plenty of ventilation. So that's, that's the, the plain track idea. The last thing I'll say here, I, you know, I have a fly swatter. You just hang around here, buddy. There's gonna be fly carnage. The last thing I'll say is you can strike the balance with the camber idea where instead of actually creating a, a refined kind of smooth curve, you can actually just clip off your corners. So you're essentially creating facets, creating that little chamfer on the corners that will, while it won't eliminate plane tracks, it changes the plane track. So instead of creating, you know, when we create a plane track, we're creating like a trough in the board. So there's the surface of the board and we've created, whoa, too much glare. We've created that little trough in the board and the plane tracks are these arises at the top. Well, if you clip the corners off, so you've got the surface of the board, now it looks a little bit more like that. I chose the wrong color for this. Fortunately, I work at a lumberyard. <laughs> and I have access to all the colors of the rainbow. So now, if you clip the corners, that is the shape you're getting. So instead of this hard corner, this hard heiress at the top, now I'm getting this look. And this is as compared to our you know, nicely cambered edge where you get this nice little smooth edge. You can see the difference here is just a facet instead of a nice curve like we're getting up here. This can be done very easily and it's exactly what I do on my jack planes and my joiner, well, 
one of my joiner planes. <laughs> the joiner plane that I use primarily for actually jointing edges, that is a straight blade. I do not do any treatment to that. I want it to be straight. I want it to create straight edges. Um, but my jack plane, it might actually be more visible here in the body itself, except there's way too much glare. Nah, I don't know if that's going to show up. This plane has the corners clipped off of it. Couldn't tell you how much, probably as much as a 16th of an inch chamfer on those corners. And as I showed earlier, it will produce plane tracks. When I take a heavy, heavy cut, it produces a plane track. But you also saw that I was able to essentially eliminate the plane tracks while they were still there. If you really, really look hard for them, they're not really showing up that much because I've created this kind of profile, this angled profile instead of a curve. And that is very easily done just by rolling your, um, your plane, or excuse me, your plane blade around the corner. So let me do rather than say, it just makes a lot more sense if I just show you. Here again, um, I, would, I would start with a, with a heavier grit stone. This is already set up. I don't really want to add any more to this, so I'm going to go to my, my really, really fine stone. I wouldn't recommend trying to do this on the fine stone because it's just going to take a long, long time. Um, also, these are diamond stones. They don't wear grooves in them really easily. If you have water stones, be careful when you do this. You will want to groove into it, so you do want to be uh, particularly cautious. I start and I just stand it up. Stand it up. So I'm clipping off that corner and I'm really, instead of just running back and forth and really creating a chamfer, I am rounding it a little bit. And then I go back to sharpening as I normally would. And that little clipped corner you've created, that is not a cutting surface. Unlike the chamfer, or excuse me, that nice, smooth curve we created. We want that evenly or, or consistently sharp from edge to edge. This, this chamfer really, it will end up being sharp-ish, but it's really about tucking the corners up out of the cut. So you don't have to obsess too much about getting that perfectly straight um, or perfectly sharp. You just want to nip those corners off and then go back to sharpening the rest of the blade, the straight part of the blade. And that will give you that, that same profile. But again, if you're doing that for the first time, go over to a coarser stone. That's actually one of the reasons that I have this extra, extra coarse diamond stone floating around. It's also a great place you can just grab a mill file um, and run the mill file over it. I actually recommend um, taking the stone to the file, holding the file and rolling the, the blade because now you have control over the motion of the blade. Rather as if you run the blade over, or excuse me, run the file over the blade, you tend to want to slice your fingers open. So you're actually rolling that along a file and you can shape those edges just as quickly. Um, if I use a file, what I will tend to do is come back to a finer grit stone and just roll it like I did before because it's just cleaning up any possible burrs or any frayed edges that could catch, in, um, could catch a shaving and cause a shaving to tear. So if you're doing this, um, say I did this on my extra fine stone, I would work up through the grits so that I am, you know, refining that and giving me somewhat of a smooth corner so it's not going to catch any shavings there. So that's, that's a key point. It's not, it's not so much um, refining the edge to sharpness, you're just refining the edge so that it doesn't end up uh, forming a clogging hazard later on. And that process, as I said, in my jack plane, in my wooden jack plane has that same process. Um, my wooden joiner plane has the corners clipped like that. My regular joiner plane does not. I, I like to keep it that way because I use that for match planing, particularly wide boards, and I want every, every inch of blade width in that particular instance. Because obviously, again, like the camber, we're slightly reducing the effective cutting width of the blade by adding those little chamfers into it. Questions? Do we have any questions on that? It is a process that is easily repeatable in that you're not trying for consistency. By erasing that camber and starting a new one, it does not matter um, 
what that curvature was or how centered it was on the blade because you're starting afresh every single time. And that's particularly important. Um, it also just makes things so much easier in the long run. Um, and it makes it just achievable either freehand or with a guide. You guys saw me use a freehand method here because that's the way I sharpen. I don't own a guide anymore. But you could see that same thing could be done just as easily with a guide. The uh, subtlety of that curve, the curve just being created by hand pressure alone, I don't care how stable your guide is. You could have the widest wheel in the world on your guide. Hand pressure alone will create that curvature. That's all it's going to take. Um, and when it comes to clipping the corners off, that is a freehand method. There's no way to do that. I suppose you could put it in the guide and still run the corner over. That obviously is, is, a, is a different story, but you're still sharpening the edge flat in a guide just as you were. So again, even though you guys saw me do it freehand, don't let that deter you. It doesn't have to be done that way. It can be done uh, using a honing guide. Hmm, let's see if there's any questions I missed here. Thirty degrees may affect the dubbing effect if stropped. Maybe. I think the dubbing effect is way overstated. The dubbing effect is what happens when an edge is rounded over. Because a strop is flexible and because a strop will kind of um, squeeze around a blade as you're stropping, it will squeeze around the edge and it creates a slightly convex bevel. Um, and that can be a problem unless you embrace convex bevel sharpening, which those of you out there in the world who are Paul Sellers fans know that that's how he does it too. And that's how hundreds and thousands of our forefathers did it as well. I don't think it's that big of a deal. The issue with stropping is dubbing will round over the edge over time. So you, you can't strop forever. You do eventually have to go back to a stone and reset that bevel. And that's, that's really what I call it. Call me a child of the Atari 2600, but using the stones is me hitting the reset button on Pac-Man because I got sick of that level. Um, if you dub a lot, you'll find that that round and that convex bevel is essentially steepening the cutting angle of that bevel, which can get to a point where it doesn't cut very well at all. Go back to the stone and erase it. Um, but yeah, I... It doesn't prevent me from using a strop for like six months before I go back to a stone and having any issues. I've got carving gouges that I have never used on a stone that I've just stropped. Um, you know, the higher quality gouges that come with a good bevel angle already sharp, um, and I just strop them. And granted, I don't use carving gouges nearly as much as I use hand planes, but I've been stropping these carving gouges for like six years. <laughs> never put them on a stone because it's just not necessary. Cool, cool. Um, well then, guys, I think I can call it a call it a night. But um, uh, Kirby says, "What guidelines for determining which blades to leave straight, which to knock the corners off?" Um, I think I answered that. But in case it wasn't clear, the only one I keep straight is my joiner plane, um, and the reason I do that is because I often will match plane boards, and when you match plane boards, you need maximum width possible. And just clipping those corners, if I clip like a sixteenth of an off on each corner, I've now reduced my width of blade by an eighth of an inch. And if I'm trying to um, match plane two five quarter boards or two eight quarter boards, uh, well, I can't match plane two eight quarter boards with one pass. But if I try to match plane two six quarter boards, I can't do it with a single pass. And that's the idea, to try to maximize the width of the blade. The rest of the time, pff, no, I clip those corners because it just makes things so much easier. Jeffrey says, low angle block plane. <laughs> Why are you shouting at me? Come on. Um, I don't know that I have time to really go into the low angle thing, but um, I mean, I love the fact that there is a term called low angle block plane. Why do we need to modify block plane with low angle? All block planes should be low angle. I know that they're not. I know that there are some standard old block planes, but to me, that's called a mistake. Don't buy them. Why would, you, why would you buy a block plane unless it's low angle? What's, what's the point of that? Um, yes, low angle works better on end grain, but low angle also reduces the force required because it's reducing the cutting angle. When you've got a tiny little plane with very little mass, you want it to be easier to push. When you put a standard angle on a block plane, it makes it harder to push. 
and it becomes a royal pain in the you know what to work with because you've got this tiny little mass thing that you can't really get your hands around having to work harder on it. Stupid. Dumb idea. I know Stanley did it too. Veritas was just following in their footsteps. It's dumb. Dumb idea. So yeah, if you're going to use a block plane, don't call it a low angle block plane because a block plane by its definition is low angle. And if your block plane is not low angle, sell it and go get a real block plane. Get a man's block plane. Yeah. As far as um, the whole bevel up versus bevel down, uh, there is not time to go into that right now. <laughs> I've got a kind of a hard stop from the better half on that one. So. If you had to choose between the Lee Nielsen rabbit block or the regular block, which one? Go with the rabbit block because it's just more functional. It's more utility. Hmm, I didn't know better. Don't be mean. Don't cry, Matthew. It's okay. All right, guys. Um, I'm sure that I missed some questions in here. I know there's a lot here. I do appreciate your questions. Um, this was meant to be a uh, like 45 minute demo and it turned into an hour and 15. So hopefully it did help you with the whole idea of, of plane tracks and why you don't need to worry about it. And any other questions that I didn't cover, come back next week and we'll talk about them then. Cool. Great. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great Labor Day weekend too. And we'll see you all next week.